Peace, everybody. Welcome to Capital Combat. The name says it all. I'm Hakeem Branch, and today I'm going to recap this weekend's fight action, which included a double header in two different locations in New York. We had Sullivan Barrera versus Dimitri Vival and Sergey Kovalev versus uh, Igor McCalkin in uh, Madison Square Garden. And then over in Brooklyn, we had Andre Durrell versus Jose Uzcategui and Deontay Wilder versus Luis Ortiz. So I'm going to try to get through all of these really, really quick because, of, you know, it was a lot of action in these fights, a lot of tactical elements. And I'm going to try to touch on a little bit in each one to give you, you know, a fair recap on what happened. So we'll start on the HBO card in which in the opening bout we had two light heavyweight contenders who were vying for uh, the space in line to challenge the top dogs which are Adonis Stevenson, Sergey Kovalev and the like. So in Bivol we had a guy who is on the come up. He has a shiny record. I think he's 12-0 with 10 knockouts. Um, now 13-0 with 11. Uh, spoiler alert. Anyway... He took on a very sharp, very strong competitor in Sullivan Barrera. And what I noticed in this fight is that for all the skill that Sullivan Barrera has, Cuban uh, amateur national, uh, extensive pro experience for uh, very decent guys in the pro ranks, he's a guy who is very technically sound, very tight puncher, uh, decent pop, and it gets better as fights go along. And when he was in there with Bivol, he was in there with someone who was just a step above in every way. Sullivan Barrera is a very tight puncher. Bivol punched even tighter. Barrera has decent power. Bivol showed some very, very good shocking power. Both guys were technically sound. But Bivol was able to get into those holes a lot quicker than Barrera was. He had quicker hand speed, better foot placement. And it was very enlightening to see that because we hadn't seen Bivol in there with somebody that was that good yet. And he showed that he was in that conversation that a lot of people are already putting him in. He belongs there. He belongs in the conversation with the top light heavyweights. He was able to batter Barrera, hurt him extensively throughout the fight, and then finally stop him in the final round, something that no other fighter had done to that point. A lot of guys caught Barrera cold. Um, Andre Ward was able to catch him squared up, but nobody was able to finish him and dominate him the way Dimitri Bivol did. And that's saying a lot, considering the people that he's been up against, the Shabranskis, the Andre Wards, uh, Joe Smith Jr. Uh, he's been, you know, the mid-level... And also the high level because he fought Ward, who was one of the best in the division. So for him to be dominated like that, it was a big statement for Bivol. And I'm really looking forward to where he goes next. Uh, possibly against Kovalev, because I think uh, he now has one of the vacant titles. And that would be a very good matchup. So let's talk about Kovalev and McCalkin. So in this one, we had Kovalev, who in my opinion... Look the best that he has in years. Um, it may have been the opponent, but um, there were also some things to take away from it in a learning uh, aspect as well. He was able to fight it, fire off that right hand almost automatically at will against McCalkin, who was a southpaw, and it was no tell on it. It had very high power, and it had good speed as well. Uh, like I said, McCalkin had no answer for it, and Kovalev was hitting him with it all night. He would square up, fire it. He would fire it from the rear as well, from the rear shoulder. And he set it up with a very decent jab as well. He also did some good work to the body, which we don't see him do often. So he's adding some elements to his game, and that could be scary for some of these other light heavyweights out there because until he met Andre Ward, this was the man to beat. And he's very quickly becoming the man to beat again. Uh, McCalkin, on the other hand, uh, was able to give Kovalev some good looks. He presented some good angles. And he also landed a lot of clean shots. 
Unfortunately, he didn't have any type of power to even uh, make Kovalev slow down in his work. So he was able to just ignore these shots, but he was getting hit very cleanly at times. And that's something to show concern about, especially if he's got somebody like Dmitry Bivol up next, who is very quick and looked quicker than McCulkin did in his fight against Barrera and also has a lot more power. So if we do see these guys together, we're going to see really what Kovalev is made out of because he's probably going to go through a lot of adversity in that fight and we'll really see if he's going to look for a way out or if he's going to step up, bite down on that mouthpiece and get the job done. So that's why I'm really excited about that potential fight. So with that in mind, I'm going to go over to the other New York car. We're going to go over to Brooklyn. Uh, Andre Durrell versus Jose Uzkategi, which was a rematch in which Durrell won the vacant, um, I believe, IBF belt from um, a disqualification after the eighth round when he was hit after the bell. In this one, we pretty much got the exact same fight. Uh, Uzkategi was able to pressure Durrell on the ropes, land his right hand at will, land combinations, and Durrell just could not keep him off of him. He still presented the angles. He showed a decent hand speed. But when he landed, they had no effect on Uzkatagi. He had the will of someone who would not be denied. So he just kept coming, kept throwing those combinations, landed a vicious uh, triple left hand at the beginning of the eighth round that really started to spell the end for Andre Durrell. And to his credit, he fought his butt off in that final round that they had together and it just wasn't enough and you can see him go to that corner dejected at the end and even though his uh, new trainer Virgil Hunter pleaded with him to keep going to just let his hands go and fight back the body language just wasn't there and uh, the cut man and the doctor ended up stopping the fight so Uzkotaki is now in that super middleweight conversation with the uh, the new bell holder who is um escapes my mind right now who just beat uh the gale um you got my man benavidez who looks like the number one guy right now between him and zerto ramirez those are the top two guys right now in that division and so now we got uzkatagi placing his name in that conversation as well we got a lot of people in that division that have skill and name recognition that we can see some good fights and i'm looking forward to those so in the main event we had a heavyweight uh title fight between deontay wilder and luis ortiz now we know the history between these two guys they were slated to fight back in october ortiz failed the drug test he was replaced by stavern we know how that ended but wilder demanded that he fight ortiz again and he got his wish and he got a fight. Uh, it was not a lot of leather being thrown early, but there was a lot of tactical things going on to where both guys were trying to adjust to each other's advantages. Whereas Wilder was trying to keep Ortiz's southpaw savvy and Cuban amateur and pro experience mitigated by using his jab, using movement using uh, bo upper body movement, moving laterally. He did well, but Ortiz was winning those rounds early through activity. He wasn't landing a lot. Uh, he landed a body shot every now and then. He landed a head shot every now and then. But Wilder would just hit him with a jab every now and then. Kind of sizing him up, trying to feel where it was until the, about the fifth round where he lowered the boom, was able to drop Ortiz with a right hand, they hit him right on the forehead and like watching it live i thought he you know i thought he missed and then ortiz was hurt and i was like man what happened and they showed the replay and i mean that thing landed right there on the noggin and had ortiz in a lot of trouble he was able to get out of that round and then in the seventh round he was able to come back and land some devastating punches of his own and Looked like he had Wilder out on his feet, but Wilder was able to grab, he was able to throw back, and show the ref enough that he didn't stop the fight. 
So that round ended, and it went back to that tactical, um, that tactical battle. But Wilder was getting a little bit more brave with his shots. He knew, you know, he knew what he had in front of him in Ortiz, and he started to go for it a bit more. Now, the detractors have pointed out how wild he gets, and that was definitely evident in this fight. Um, when he was trying to get Ortiz out of there, he did uh, throw technique to the wind and throw his punches with a little more um, abandon. And honestly, that probably made the fight go longer than it should have gone. I would really love for him to start calming himself down and remember to still place those shots because when you have the power he has, you don't need to go crazy like that all he has to do is touch people and he'll hurt them that and the other thing that i would like to see him do is and i see it a lot in his in his highlights and his training videos he's working on his left hand a lot but his left hook looked terrible all night and he was slapping with it it was no body being thrown behind it and when he did, he would over um, overthrow it and end up throwing himself off balance. And I would really love for him to keep on trying to hone that left hook and be able to throw it calmly under fire rather than the, the panicky way he was doing it. And if we can get that from out of Wilder, we're going to have one scary dude. Because we already know he can hurt people with the left hand when he does land it. And we already know he has that devastating right hand. So if he can get that left hook technically down, we have a serious threat in the heavyweight division. Yes, he's a bell holder, but he's not looked at as the best guy. Right now, Anthony Joshua is looked at as the best heavyweight guy. And he's fighting Joseph Parker at the end of the month. But I think that is what he should continue to work on and Work on it in sparring as well so he can get it down while he's under fire. Get some really tough guys to really push him and really get that left hook turned over, whether he throws it thumb up or uh, thumb down, so he can get that real knuckle to chin extension because he was landing a lot like this rather than like this, the way you want the hook to land. So if he can work on getting that hook turned over, getting that elbow up, because getting that elbow up is key to getting that fist where it needs to be in order to land it effectively. And that's what I want to see from Wilder. So we uh, wait to see if we get that Joshua match, depending on if he gets past Joseph Parker, who is a very capable heavyweight. And we'll see what happens in Ortiz later on in the, um, you know, he, this is his first loss. He's still a very good heavyweight, still very capable, and still very dangerous to a lot of guys out of there. So we'll see what happens with him as well. But that's it, guys. Thanks for watching. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to keep up with myself and Rob. We'll be doing our videos together, um, and they'll actually be coming out sooner because of our work schedules, um, which is a good thing. So hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon so you can get your updates from Naya. You can follow us on all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Capital of Combat. And if you have any questions, any of your thoughts on the fights, put them down below. And, you know, we will answer you. We love to uh, chat with you guys. So hit us up, let us know what you think, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Until then, fight on. And you've already lost They don't seem to see that everything we've done is coming and gone My fists are on fire I perform till I perspire My demons are in a rage Keep thinking that it's a game I kick rhyme, hurricane I told them I don't play I'm liquid Black Street Fighter Street Fighter Street Fighter